Hello, Kidney Warriors. James here from Dadvice TV, your online kidney health coach. And this is another episode of Dadvice TV Live. And it's Tuesday, so you know what that means. We got our favorite renal dietitian here with us. But before we get to that, if you're new, go ahead, introduce yourself in the comments. Say hello. Hey, Kathy, how you doing? Or Kathleen, sorry, I read it a little too quick there. Introduce yourself. Get to know our great community. Our community is so helpful, so supportive, so positive, and just absolutely amazing. As a matter of fact, I was just talking to Jim before the show started, and I told her, I have had a rough, rough week at work, but I am so excited to be here with all of you because this is like so relaxing for me. I actually look so forward to being here with everyone. Now, those of you that are new, you may be thinking, who is this guy that's talking a lot and he's super energetic and stuff? My name is James. I'm the creator of Dadvice TV and I have kidney disease. Matter of fact, I had stage five kidney disease. I had a single digit GFR. Things were not looking very good, but I did not go on dialysis. I didn't get a transplant. I instead I hunkered down. I made some lifestyle changes. I started exercising. I got my weight under control. I've kind of let that go a little bit the last year. You guys can see it, but I'm working on it. I started, you know, focusing on blood pressure, getting my, my not eating too much sugar, looking at what I'm eating, working with the renal dietitian, which is by far the single best thing I ever did to help improve not only my overall health, but my kidney health. Today, I don't have a single symptom. Kidney disease, I kicked it to the curb. My last set of labs showed that I was stage three and I feel great. I am happy. Even if I spend the rest of my life at stage three, I'm fine and dandy. So that's kind of a quick little introduction of who I am. Now tonight, we're gonna be talking about something I get asked about all the time. Coffee and kidney disease. And let me tell you something, I did a little bit of Googling, a little bit of research on YouTube, and I found all sorts of things on there, things that I knew were blatantly wrong, some things that were accurate, and some that really didn't answer that question. Well, we are going to talk all about coffee and some other things tonight, but we got to get the information from someone who knows about coffee, who knows about uh, nutrition and all those things that matter. Go ahead and say hello. You guys know who I'm about to introduce. Our favorite renal dietitian here on Dadvice TV, Jen Hernandez. Hey, Jen, how you doing? Hi, James. Hi, everyone. So good to be back tonight again. Uh, really excited to talk about coffee because I too love drinking coffee and I'm so happy to have good news for myself and for other people here tonight. Um, but we're going to dive into that in just a little bit. For those of you that don't know who I am, my name is Jen and I am a registered dietitian. I am board certified in renal nutrition and that has been after years of working with people in dialysis and in private practice and with the National Kidney Foundation regarding their kidney health. So I've worked across the spectrum of all stages, stages one through end stage on dialysis, helping them with their best diet so that they could eat really well and feel even better when it comes to their kidney health and overall health. So if you're looking for more information about me, what I do, or even some more ideas, tips, and info about renal nutrition, you can head over to my website and it's plantpoweredkidneys.com. That is where I have my blog articles every week up and running for you to learn more about renal nutrition. I have some more interesting information on there about myself and about what I do for the kidney community, including my Plant Powered Kidneys course, which as a hint, is going to be opening later this spring. So Ooh, great. Uh, keep, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So keep your eyes and ears peeled for that. Uh, there is a wait list that you can put uh, your name and email address on 
my website if you want to be notified and get first in line for when that opens up. But if you're looking for support in the meantime and a great friendly community, the Plant Powered Kidneys community on Facebook is a private but free Facebook group that is available to all. All you need to do is answer the questions and acknowledge the rules. We want to keep this a positive, uplifting, and motivational area. So you do that, you are in the group, and you are part of this Facebook group of thousands of kidney warriors that are all there to focus on a plant-based diet for their kidney health. And you will be amazed with how much support and recipes that you can find oh, on yeah. there. And I'll tell you, and I even already see someone who's who's new to us saying, hey, I got kidney disease, what do I eat? You go to that group, you are gonna see all sorts of amazing recipes. And what you gotta eat is kind of unique to each and every one of mm -hmm. us. And you'll learn about mm -hmm. that in there. But the, the, the Plant Powered Kidneys Facebook group has so many ideas and suggestions that you are not going to be bored eating. And I've learned so much from there. And I love it when Jen does cooking videos. Those are great. And those of you that are new, watch her cut something on there. She is like a master <laughs> chef. I've been practicing, Jen. I'm getting better okay. at cutting, but I'm still pretty slow. I'm not like, like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's been, it's taken me years, I tell you. And even when I was in uh, my undergrad for uh, nutritional science, I worked at a restaurant oh. as a server. And then I also, for the food service part, I wanted to get experience in the kitchen for nutrition. So I worked under the chef and I cut so many melons and I prepped so many veggies and, and fruits and all kinds of stuff. So I did a lot of that. So I got pretty comfortable using knives for a long yep. time. <laughs> well, that is definitely a great skill. And mm -hmm. as I am cooking more and more for, for myself, which allows me to avoid those heavily processed, awful foods that are out there, and lets me kind of be creative and artistic, I'm gonna get mm -hmm. better at that too. But yeah. let's jump into our topic for today because we've got a lot of information here to share. Coffee, coffee is something that, you know, before kidney disease, Mm -hmm. I, I, every day I had coffee. That that was my wake up juice. I had to have yeah. my coffee. Now mine was some really bad naughty coffee. Um, it was a venti <laughs> caramel macchiato, extra extra caramel, not just extra, extra extra. Mm -hmm. And I'd say mm -hmm. please be a little heavy handed on those pumps back there. <laughs> <laughs> and I would start my day with a cup of some coffee and a lot of sugar. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, it seemed to be a lot more sugar than it was coffee. And I kind of got addicted to that. I needed that if I didn't have it. Um, and then when I got diagnosed with kidney disease, I stopped everything right away. Just, I was just like, I'm confused. I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Water's best. Boom, I went to water. And, and water's great. I mix in my mm -hmm. flavors. I love my water. I got my big thing just filled it up right here for more water but a cup of coffee is nice gives you a little bit of a kick gives some energy and stuff so we're going to talk about coffee and and kidney disease um i forgot to bring up my list of questions here <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with nutrition we think yeah. of coffee as beans we run some hot boiling water over it or we steam it or something and the water turns brown with flavor and some kind of kick to it. But it's more than just colored water. There are There is some nutrition in there. What yes, is in absolutely. coffee? Absolutely. So while coffee itself doesn't provide a ton of the macronutrients, so we're talking about protein, carbohydrates, and fat, it only has about five calories per cup. So very, very low calories and none of the macronutrients. It does have other nutritional benefits and features of it, I'll say. So in just one eight ounce cup, which as a side note or as a side challenge, I challenge you to take your usual coffee mug and measure how many ounces. Yeah, how many ounces it holds. Uh, okay, so I know my wife's, I think it's like 16 or 20. It holds mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, I have my giant one. So you you saw the one that I had from before. This one I used for my, 
I use for my pens and, and I have some candy canes from the holidays in here. So <laughs> Hey, you've this got one... great self-control at not eating these those already. <laughs> well, they're there. I know they're always there. So it's like, oh, they're not going anywhere. This cup is like the size of my head, right? It's pretty close, I would say. That is a ton. Yeah. This is a big cup and it's kind of a joke cup, but still there are a lot of coffee cups that people use like this that are really, really big and hold a lot more coffee than we think. So eight ounces is the standard recommended. When we say a cup of coffee, we're saying eight ounces of coffee. I'm not saying a cup of coffee. I'm saying eight ounces of coffee. So in eight ounces of coffee, you'll get about 95 milligrams of caffeine. And you'll also get uh, about 116 milligrams of potassium. So this is still considered to be a food with potassium. It's in the low potassium category. Mm -hmm. But if we think again about that eight ounces, every eight ounces, you're putting in another 100 plus milligrams of potassium that could pretty quickly turn into a high potassium food. The yeah. other thing that coffee has, they has a lot of great antioxidants. So this is where we start looking at some of the benefits of coffee and even the research, the studies, even the studies I'll talk about tonight, um, there can still be questions that the research will point out and say, well, we don't know if it's the caffeine, we don't know if it's the antioxidants because getting in again to nutrition science and really hunkering down into the exact reason can be pretty tough and takes a lot, a lot of science and a lot of research. So. That being said, when we talk about benefits or risks or things like that, there's a lot of factors to think of, not just the big umbrella and not just pointing at one specific thing, unless there has been enough evidence to show that there is that direct correlation. Uh, so first of all, some of the benefits for regular routine coffee drinkers. So the ones that get up and have their cup of coffee in the morning, and that's just the way they start their morning. People who are regular coffee drinkers have a lower risk for developing uh, situations like type 2 diabetes, liver cirrhosis, cancer, and even Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. So there are benefits to having your routine cups of coffee. The other thing that is interesting about coffee is it's almost like a bell curve when it comes to the risks associated with drinking coffee. So it has a protective effect and there is a certain point that it hits where it's no longer protective, like going above. So it's not like a more is better kind of situation. There's a stopping point with how much is okay. And then going beyond that, you can increase problems, which we'll definitely dive into. Yeah, and and someone just asked a pretty cool question here. Um, if the coffee's decaf, um, is it still got about the same amount of potassium, or does that also get reduced when they decaffeinate it? I believe it has the same amount. I'll have to double check on that. But the decaffeination process shouldn't be reducing the potassium, not significantly, at least. Yeah, when but you that's think a about really it, good question. Yeah, when you think about an eight ounce cup. 116 milligrams or so of potassium isn't that much. It's easy to fit into your daily mm -hmm. diet, but eight ounces is when it's in a cup, that, that's a small cup. That's a very small cup. Yeah. And back in my day, I started the morning off. You know, I drove into work, rode a train, took the train to work, walked into the office. I didn't go in the door. I went to Starbucks. If Starbucks was mm -hmm. busy, I had Tully's, the Tully's was busy. I had Pete's coffee right there because I was in Seattle. So just coffee everywhere, just stretch yeah. your arms, you hit it. <laughs> I'd get my cup and then I'd drink that on the way up the elevator. I'd actually finish it by the time I got to my desk and throw it away, one of the first things I'd do. And then we're all working and someone's like, hey, you wanna go for a coffee? That was your break. And yeah. I would drink, and first of all, they were large, they're Venti's. I don't know how many ounces that is. It's way more than eight. 30. I would. 30. Oh my goodness. Holy cow. So it's almost four. So that's, that's oh, no, like I'm five. sorry. I'm sorry. That's Venti is 24. I'm sorry. I'm getting my numbers mixed up. So 24, Venti that's three. So that's, that's Trent almost 400 30. milligrams of yeah. potassium. Now this is no longer really a low potassium right. food. And if I had, it's easy to have three or four of these in a day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my credit card, 
loved me when I moved away from Seattle and got rid of coffee. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm tired of carrying all that weight for all those drinks. But it really can add up to where no longer yeah. is it a, a minor bit of potassium that you're adding. So right. how, right. We, we think a lot about the caffeine in the coffee. Mm-hmm. Um, and he mentioned that it has about 95 milligrams in an eight ounce. How much caffeine can I have safely in a day? Mm -hmm. I don't even know how much caffeine is too much. Yeah. So the general recommendations for healthy adults, and that's where a lot of the dietary guidelines will specify for healthy adults up to 400 milligrams a day. And with the idea that a cup of coffee will brew 95 milligrams of caffeine, there is a range to that. So depending on how strongly the coffee is brewed, even the type of bean, even uh, there's a lot of different variations. So you don't want to just assume that it's 95. It could be higher than that. It could be over hundred milligrams per cup. Uh, so if you think about in general, like three to four cups or so, if you go over 500 milligrams, that's where people of caffeine, that's where people can experience complications or, or symptoms from having excessive caffeine. And that includes anxiety, which kind of makes sense. If you think about that much caffeine running through your body that you're probably wired. I know if I have an extra cup, I am, I'm typing faster than I can keep up with. And I'm like, all right, I know, I know I've hit too much, but you can also experience problems like constipation, even diarrhea and rapid heart rate. Again, of course, because you have that much of a stimulus in your body that is affecting you. So it's, it's important to know again, that this, like this, shape this u-shaped curve for the risks so the bell-shaped curve is for the benefits the Mm u-shaped curve is the risk you have the lower risk at the bottom and then as you go over you go up towards that higher caffeine amount your risks of developing problems will go back to increasing and one the one of these things is hypertension so again if you think about what caffeine does it is meant to stimulate you to get you up and ready to go exactly Yep. Having too much rapid heart rate, it can also cause hypertension problems. But, uh, and they found, let's see, they found that people who drank less than one cup of coffee per week or more than three cups of coffee per day were found to have lower risk for developing hypertension. So mm-hmm. it almost sounds like an inverse thing where there are some protective factors in there. And again, that's where you need to dive into more about what's what's going on, like what part of the coffee is actually leading to that benefit. Yeah. So what are the benefits of coffee for those with kidney disease? So specifically with kidney disease, uh, it has been shown to be protective in those who don't have kidney disease. There was a review in 2020 that found a significant decrease in the risk for developing kidney disease in those who were deemed coffee drinkers compared to those that were non-coffee drinkers. And there was a study in 2019 that did compare coffee consumption, how much coffee somebody or people drink per day with kidney function. And they looked specifically at GFR and the protein in their urine. They tracked that and they found an extra cup of coffee per day had a protective effect against stages three through five, the later stages in chronic kidney disease and albuminuria, which is protein in the urine. But again, they did say, yeah, but they did say, well, we don't know, is this because of the antioxidants? Is this the caffeine effect? Is this something that resulted in lower inflammation, which then helped with being preventive and, and helping to keep the kidney safe? There's a lot of questions with that that needs to for, to really find out exactly what's going on there. But they did find that association. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and I've given up, someone asked, James, do you drink coffee? I used to. I've given it up completely. My wife is shocked. I wake up. You guys, I've worked a very, very long day today. I got up, I was telling Jen, 6 a.m., started stuff. I have been busy all day. This, you guys are seeing me tired. I wake up naturally, super high energy. My wife is shocked without coffee. I have, I may, might drink one cup maybe every three months or so, and it is a small cup. 
There mm-hmm. may be a day where I'm like, you know what? I'm going to stay up because there's some good show that just came out or something like that. Binge watching. That's my weakness. Um, <laughs> I'll stay up all night and I'll watch something and I'll drink a cup of coffee to help give me some energy and get me through the next day. Uh, but those are very, very rare. Um, mm-hmm. And it's only because it's not that I'm worried about coffee. It's I've just gotten so accustomed to water. But I love that. This idea of maybe one cup every so often may have some protective benefits for kidney patients. I like that. Yeah, and we'll definitely, after we go through a lot of these uh, medical kind of information, the medical research, we'll talk about really what makes coffee kidney friendly and the smart choices that you want to have to make sure that you're not offsetting the benefits by putting in something like that oh, extra, yeah. extra caramel that might, exactly. I, uh, that might offset that was, the benefit. No, it didn't matter what was in that cup. That extra, extra caramel just made it awful yeah. for my health. <laughs> you know, it's like, give me a little bit of diabetes in there. Choo, 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 they're putting it in there. <laughs> I, I've learned to stop that. That I know is so dangerous. It um, makes me think of um, the office where Michael offered Pam. She said, she asked him, it was early in the morning and they were doing like a paper delivery. Uh-huh. And Pam said, oh, do you have any coffee? And he passed over a thermos and he said, milk and sugar. And she's like, thank you. And she started drinking it. She's like, is this only milk and sugar? And he's like, yep. <laughs> like, I never, I don't remember that episode. I don't think I saw that. That is hilarious. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. It's so funny. That, that That's yeah, how that's... I drink my coffee. Very little <laughs> yeah. coffee, lots of sugar. Yeah, and that makes a difference. So what other benefits are there for kidney patients from drinking mm-hmm. coffee? So one of the things that people with kidney disease or kidney issues want to be aware of is cardiovascular disease, because cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death for people with kidney disease. And we don't always think about that because we're, th- we're so focused on the kidneys, but the kidneys play such an intricate part into our health in so many different factors. And our heart is very closely tied to what is going on with our kidneys, especially when we think about like blood pressure. Uh, So when consumed regularly or routinely, evidence has shown about three upwards of five cups of coffee per day is associated with a 15% reduction in risk of cardiovascular disease. So that is really great to think about this long-term health benefit in lowering your risk for cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease. Now, by no means am I telling you to go from not drinking any coffee to five cups a day, because that is not a safe thing to do. The first thing you want to do is discuss adding coffee to your diet with your doctor or with your dietitian to make sure that you don't have any type of health situation that would be uh, unfortunate for you to start drinking coffee. So, be aware that these benefits are taught. We're talking about certain benefits, but by no means am I saying go ahead and brew that next pot of coffee. You want mm-hmm. to check with your healthcare team and make sure it makes sense for you and your health. So I just want to say that really quickly. But uh, a whole nother area when it comes to benefits with kidney disease is in relation to diabetes. So specifically type two diabetes, there was a really, there was a big study, uh, over 2,700 women were in this study. Some had kidney disease and some had uh, kidney disease and diabetes. They found that the women with diabetes who drank at least two cups a day had a lower risk in developing diabetic nephropathy, which is uh, basically kidney damage from diabetes compared to those who drank less than one cup a day. So just two cups a day, 16 ounces, there was some benefits showed there. And then there was a review that was done just this year overlooking uh, almost 70 studies and looking at the relationship between coffee and diabetes. And they found that drinking coffee was tied to a lower risk of diabetes. So there are some benefits in having coffee if you have type two diabetes. Now, with type 1 diabetes, there was a study that looked at drinking three or more cups of coffee per day. They found that there was an increased risk for metabolic syndrome, and metabolic syndrome is basically a collection of risk factors. It has to do with your waist circumference. It has to do with your uh, diabetes or risk for diabetes, basically that lead up to having an increased risk of heart disease and stroke. So there is something to be 
careful about when it comes to uh, type one, really because of this relationship of not having insulin and needing insulin injections. That's really what we're looking at for the difference between type one and type two related to coffee. Mm -hmm. Now, coffee with the caffeine in it is somewhat of a, uh, it, it dehydrates you when you drink it. It's not, you know, you think you're drinking, it's like alcohol. You can drink a bunch mm -hmm. of alcohol, but you're really not helping your hydration. You're hurting it. Yeah. And when we get dehydrated, we're at more risk of that, <laughs> that painful thing, kidney stones. Is that something we need to worry about? And those of you out there that are, that are kind of laughing, if you've ever had a kidney stone, you only want one and that's the last one you ever want. This yeah. will be on your mind. Do I have to worry about drinking coffee, increasing the risk of those painful kidney stones? So here's the thing. There was some research from several years ago that showed including caffeinated beverage, such as coffee, with, uh, within the beverage intake had a lower risk of developing kidney stones. Then mm. there was a review at, in 2020 looking at the NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Surveys, basically those, uh, those surveys that we get from the entire population. You know, people will come to your door, and ask for, you know, questions surveying about, you know, your, your demographics, basically. So this is a, a nutrition one, basically. They did find an increased risk of recurring kidney stones in people who already had a history of recurring kidney stones in relation to drinking coffee. So for those who already were getting kidney stones, drinking coffee didn't really do anything to prevent it. Um, the people who didn't have the recurring ones, they didn't really have any changes. So that's been more updated from the, that big review. And then this year, they looked, there was a review that looked over 13 different studies and looking at both coffee and tea. And they found, they basically concluded to say with moderate coffee consumption. So again, we're looking at a couple cups maybe per day. There was no increase in risk for kidney stones but they did emphasize that you need to have enough fluids. So you need to make sure you're drinking plenty and plenty of fluids. Yeah, and for those who have kidney stones, so long as you're not on a fluid restriction, which by the way, it, there is such a thing to have kidney stones and be on a fluid restriction. It is very tough, it is painful, oh. and it is something that you should work with a dietitian about because it is a tough, it's a tough thing to do. Uh, but if you have kidney stones and your doctor is encouraging a lot of fluids, you can have coffee, but make sure you're having other beverages too, and you're not using coffee as a replacement for your fluids. Yeah, and coffee does count, and tea, as a fluid, but it should not be your replacement. So we've yeah. talked about some of the potential benefits or positives mm -hmm. of coffee for those with kidney disease. What about the other side of that coin, yeah. the bad yeah. things? What are the the things we got to keep an eye out on with coffee that aren't very good for those of us with kidney disease? So the first one, probably the most obvious, coffee is a fluid. And with that, you need, if you're on a fluid restriction, you need to account for that coffee. Coffee can create urine, but you're not going to drink eight ounces and get rid of eight ounces. That's not the way it works. So you want to take into consideration how much coffee you're drinking and factor that in as part of your fluid restriction. And just like James and I were talking about earlier, you want to know how many ounces because ordering a venti is 24 ounces. And for some people, that's 75% of their fluid needs for the day. So it's very, very important to understand getting that large cup of coffee that might set you over or kind of cut you off for the rest of your day if that's what you want to have. You know, I just looked at um, the sizes and how many ounces they are for the traditional Starbucks one. Even a, a small, called a tall, mm -hmm. is 12 ounces. That's one and a half servings mm -hmm. of coffee. Is a Trenta real? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. 30 ounces? Yeah. I don't know if they still have it or not, to be honest. Um, I don't yeah. know. Woo. The only time I've ever got it is for tea. So, 
Yeah, it makes sense for Teagues. You take it, you share it. Right. Wow. Whew. Okay, so too much fluid is definitely a concern yeah. uh, because we got to count for that. What mm -hmm. other concerns should we have you know, or keep an eye on with coffee? So another thing, like we're talking about that portion size, how it adds up a lot, too much caffeine. As mentioned, there is too much. There is such a thing as too much caffeine, and there is a short-term effect on an increase in blood pressure. It doesn't stay, but you can. You you might experience that. So think about that if you're going to have your cup of coffee in the morning, and then go to your doctor's appointment, and then get your blood pressure checked there. And you might have what's called white coat hypertension, which is basically you get really nervous at the doctor's office. So then your blood pressure gets up a little bit higher and you have this caffeine in your body that's making, maybe putting you a little bit more on edge. Might not be the best time to have a cup of coffee or a larger cup of coffee, especially. And again, remember the complications that can happen from having too much coffee. So the GI problems, having anxiety, having those heart palpitations. And in some cases, there's even the potential risk of having rhabdomyolysis, which is basically muscle breakdown. It's a very serious medical condition. Oh, and I'm, I'm gonna guess that if you've got muscle breakdown, that's going to release more creatinine into your yes. bloodstream, which is just going to throw your labs all off. Um, and we don't want to do that. First of all, we don't want muscle yeah. breakdown. And we want yeah. our, our labs to be our guiding light to how we're doing. Mm -hmm. And we don't want to risk getting them off. Oh, that's a shame. Now, that being said, like the rhabdomyolysis, that is a, it's not a frequent occurrence mm -hmm. when it comes to coffee. Uh, but it's one of those things that it could happen if you do yep. drink a lot, especially over time. Right. And what about potassium and phosphorus? Because we're drinking it, mm -hmm. uh, even, and we kind of touched on that a little bit. It's not that much in a cup, eight ounces, but we're not drinking right. eight ounces. Right. So it really depends on the size of coffee that you're getting, how many ounces you're getting. It can add up quite fast. So just that cup of coffee, about 120 milligrams of potassium, it doesn't have, coffee thankfully doesn't have like any phosphorus. It's organic phosphorus. I think I didn't even include it in my article because it's so minute. It's like seven milligrams of phosphorus and it's oh, organic. That's nothing. It's nothing. Yeah. Again, when we're, when we're focusing on phosphorus, just black coffee is not part of the equation there. But the potassium, as mentioned, can add up. I remember one of my one of my first in-center hemodialysis patients in Texas, he loved coffee and he drank so much coffee and his potassium would always be sky high. And we'd have to give him KXLate. And KXLate, for anyone who's taken it, is a very unpleasant medication. We basically tell them, when you take this, you, you, you're going to want to be by the bathroom because you're not leaving. It is an emergency evacuation type situation Ooh. to help eliminate that and lower the potassium. So not a fun medication, but he, he just did not want to give up his coffee. And granted, he didn't always want to take the medication either. It was a very, very risky, risk, risky and not advisable situation. I'll just I'll just say that, but keep in mind, if you have concerns about potassium, don't forget to account for the potassium in your coffee, especially if you're doing a cup at breakfast and then a cup in the afternoon, and then maybe a cup after dinner, that it adds up, it adds up really quickly. And it can go from feeling like it's nothing to being more than a banana, more than a potato. Wow. And, and you kind of mentioned coffee doesn't have any phosphorus in it. And mm -hmm. what it does is natural, which is great. So we absorb very little of it. Um, but I know a lot of us like our coffee, not black. We mm -hmm. like, like you said, some flavors Some you know, mine was excessive amounts of, of uh, sugar in one form or the other, or some kind of creamer. And I would use those powdered ones. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize the time and, and I didn't have a kidney issue then, but those are, some of those are loaded with phosphorus and I'm just oh, yeah. adding it in. And that's a chemical phosphorus. That's not natural. Yeah. One of the drinks when I was kind of checking into some of the different coffee beverages, there's the canned uh, uh, energy Starbucks energy drinks that are mm -hmm. called double shots. And those drinks have over a thousand milligrams of potassium. And I don't even know how much phosphorus, but it had added phosphates. I don't think they include it because they don't have to. Yeah. 
yeah. over a thousand milligrams of potassium in that one can, that 15 ounces. That's it. I would much rather have myself a delicious baked potato or some avocado. Right? Avocado oh, yeah. on my salad. Oh, much rather have that than all day. I, I hate to drink calories. That's one thing I really learned is don't drink mm -hmm. your calories. And in a way, that's kind of drinking away your your part of your a giant chunk of your daily potassium allowance. I could just mm -hmm. drink it down and not even realize oh, there was that potassium. Mm. Exactly. Exactly. And yeah, you're right. The sugar that can add up so fast. And it's something that sometimes we don't pay attention to, or we just kind of put a couple of teaspoons or spoonfuls in and we don't measure it. So we don't know, but again, it can add up really fast. And even the, some sugar alternatives, the sugar alcohols, those you want to be careful with as well, because those can upset your stomach as well because of the alcohol part of it, the way that it's digested in the body can lead to some bloating and indigestion or uh, even diarrhea because of the way that our body is trying to process it. Yeah. So what are, so we've kind of, we've looked at some good things, potential good things. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of sounds like moderation, which is pretty much the key to a good renal diet is moderation. Um, what are the takeaways on how can, because it sounds like we, we can do it, how can I work coffee into my day while I happen to have kidney issues? Well, for one thing, I would say just stick to one, two cups a day or so. It, you don't need to be reaching for the stars as far as having a ton of it. If it's something you want to include in your diet, just have it in that moderation. Like we say, it's definitely fine to include as long as your doctor doesn't give you any reason you shouldn't be having coffee in your diet. And then when you're preparing your cup, make sure, make sure you pay attention to what you're putting in your coffee, the milk, the creamers, those can be notorious for added phosphates and potentially more potassium as well. So you want to be aware of that type of creamer, that uh, most common type of like powdered creamer, the shelf stable one, like it's great. We don't have to keep in the fridge, but it is filled with added phosphates. So you really, really wanna be careful with the powdered creamers. Those will typically have phosphates in them that are absorbed 100% into your blood. So you wanna be careful with those. There are some kidney-friendly coffee creamers. One of the brands that I personally recommend, I, I don't add creamers to my coffee. I just add a little bit of milk and I like, you know, we did a whole thing about milk. So mm -hmm, you yeah. can go down that rabbit hole if you want. Uh, we talked a lot about milk, but for the creamers, the coffee creamers, especially coffee mate has a line called natural bliss and they even do have plant-based options there. Those Ooh. are a good option that don't have phosphates. You always want to check the label just to be sure, because even as we're recording this, uh, coffee companies or any kind of company, they can change their product without saying anything. So what we say now could be different, you know, a week, two week, a month from now. So you always want to read the label to verify that they haven't put anything else in there. But right now, the Coffee Mate Natural Bliss line is overall good. There is a silk dairy-free half and half alternative that works. There is the Starbucks um, creamer line. There's a couple of them. Some of the Starbucks creamers do have added uh, or have the additives in them. The cinnamon dolce and the pumpkin spice creamers are looking good to me right now. So those are going to be good options for kidney friendly creamers. Now, again, for milk, you have plenty of options. You still want to check the label, make sure they didn't add anything in, especially true with the shelf stable milks. So that's kind of the bottom line, what you want to check across the board. Yeah. And that's actually really good news. If, and, and I think the only hard part is if I'm somebody who, who enjoys coffee, keeping myself to just one or two cups a day, um, lets me enjoy it. Be careful what I add on it, especially those additives. And just to reemphasize something that Jen said, we got to keep checking labels. Um, mm -hmm. I have a product and I can't remember what it is, but it's sold at my local Walmart and I have to look at where it's made and they get two different sources and the different sources have different, a different formula for them. 
So you may be like, oh, there's the one I use. It doesn't have any phosphorus in it, but still double check because they could change the formula or maybe they get it from a different um, location that makes it still the same brand, pretty much tastes mm -hmm. the same to us, but it could have some things that we don't want in it. Now, for those of us that, you know, like my dad loves coffee. He, he lives off of coffee. I don't know how he sleeps. He drinks <laughs> coffee black. There ain't mm -hmm. a drop of milk in there. <laughs> he just drinks coffee. He drinks it all day long. Now, if he needed to cut back for some reason, um, are there some suggestions to help a person kind of reduce the amount of coffee they drink to get to that one to two cups a day? Yeah. And, and I've had this question from clients before too, when we talk about coffee in moderation and making sure they're not having too much of it. One of the things that I love recommending is, and this is not a nutrition thing, but this is more of a lifestyle recommendation that I think everybody could benefit from. And that's to get outside. So if coffee is part of your morning routine, because you need to wake up, you need to be energized, try just stepping outside. And if you can go for a walk, anything nice and light, refreshing, get some of that natural sunlight in there. There's tons of benefits to doing that in the morning. You help stop the change of the uh, hormone system in your body from when you're sleeping to when you wake up, you get that fresh air. So, which we know is always really, really nice to enjoy. So if you can't do a full walk, even just step outside, take a couple deep breaths, be in the sun for a minute and use that as part of your energy boost to start your day. And if you still like, you're like, if you're, if your thing is to, well, I, I really want to just kind of hold on to something warm. It's really soothing to me. What about switching to a different type of beverage? Even just some nice hot water with lemon can be really refreshing, brightening, energizing, but soothing. You could try something like the golden milk latte, which I talked about in our ginger episode. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really nice, warm, soothing type of beverage that doesn't have caffeine in it, but does have a lot of benefits for anti-inflammatory properties. So that would be a great warm beverage for you to have. Another thing too, is thinking again about your morning ritual, making sure that you're setting yourself up for a good day, but starting to fold in different habits. So the thing about coffee is that we've really built it in as a morning habit. It's our morning routine. And we can start by reducing our coffee intake in replacing it with a new type of habit. And at first, this is really hard to do, but if you can connect it to something you already are doing, then that can be a really helpful way to make that change. So if you wanna start out in the morning with some meditation and some deep breathing, you can tell yourself, I'm going to start up, wake up in the morning, get my fresh air, and then do five minutes of just sitting outside, deep breathing, and then I'll have my cup of coffee. So you start tying that into your habit, and then soon you can start to pull away from that coffee as being the initial start of your day. So whatever it is that you want to do to begin your day, it's always really nice to set intention and have a good mentality of what your day is going to look like. Very good. So I'm going to jump into a few of the questions we have here because there are some really good ones. So uh, we have a question, is tea better than coffee? And we've kind of mentioned tea and coffee almost interchangeable a couple times. I, I think it's honestly a personal preference for when it comes to your enjoyment of it. I with the benefits, there are certain benefits of tea. Keep in mind that tea can also be caffeinated. So green tea, black tea, a lot of herbal teas can have caffeine in them. The amount of caffeine can be different, especially when we're brewing our own tea. And if you leave your tea steeping for a longer time, it can be a higher concentration. So that you want to be careful of. The other thing we've talked about in other episodes is the type of tea, making sure that you're aware of risks of certain herbal teas that could have a negative effect on your health. So teas are often seen or thought of as like a wonder cure for certain situations. Oh, yeah. And that's not so many always... have promoted that way. <laughs> yeah. And it's not really the way that we should be looking at them. It's something that if we enjoy it, but don't be downing a tea that's really nasty and unenjoyable just because you think it has health benefits. You always want to check and make sure is that actually 
a proven scientific evidence-based result? Or is that just somebody who drank a tea and then something happened and then they're saying, oh, this is the magic cure-all for whatever it is. Yep, I see so many of those, unbelievable. All right, mm -hmm. Tammy asks, we were talking about additives for mm -hmm. coffee. What about honey? And it's, it's natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, honey can be added to coffee as a natural sweetener. Um, it's still going to be added sugar. So even though it's natural, I wouldn't say that you want to go very heavy handed on it. If you're used to a lot of sweetener in your coffee, it might be a good practice to kind of cut back on it and see how low you can get to where you still enjoy it. But maybe it's not as much because honey does still count as sugar in the diet. Awesome. And any opinion on half and half? I, I know that's very popular. So the half and half comes from half milk, half cream. The cream, because it is a, really it's a heavier product, will have more potassium, more phosphorus in it. Milk in those categories, when you get closer to skim milk, it's going to be lower in those quantities. Uh, so just keep in mind that it is a source of phosphorus. It is a source of potassium. The phosphorus is absorbed, I think, by 60%, I want to say. Um, no, 80%. I'm pretty sure it's 80%. Oh. It's been a while for me to remember this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so it is something to keep in mind. If it's something that is a part of your diet, you know, check with your doctor, see if there's any issues with you having it. If you're having it in like a tablespoon or so with your coffee, that doesn't sound like it's going to make that big of a difference. Again, when you're looking at making changes, you know, that's not really a big deal. Yeah. Um, but for this splash of coffee, that could make a difference in your health goals and your health outcomes. My dad put something funny. I got to put it up here. He says, I take my coffee black and medium chew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when I, after I was diagnosed and I would occasionally say, hey, I need some coffee. Brewed coffee, but not like that significantly. I think it's just about like, like 80 or so milligrams per cup, per eight ounce cup. So it's a little bit lower, but again, the thing with the nutrition facts for instant coffee, at least is that you can look on the back there and with the newer nutrition facts, they'll start to list potassium on there. So you can read that label a little bit easier than the bags of coffee beans. So that's not always going to have that information on there. So the is two or three shots. That's going to be equivalent to a cup of coffee. But if you do just one espresso shot, that is lower in potassium. It's lower. It's a little bit lower in caffeine too. Yeah. In Australia. Hey, thanks for watching down under, but it looks like a few people may be seeing some freezing on one of the, um, the YouTube servers. Um, usually when this happens, just to let you guys know, YouTube will get it corrected because they get the full video and then they'll, um, it'll be watchable later, not freezing. Also Facebook has it. Um, mm. It might be a good place to check. Though we are getting really, really close to the top of the hour. And someone says they can't It's good to know us. that the recording, I was gonna say, it's good to know that the recording at least, because I mean, I, I don't have oh, yeah. any glitching on my side. And it's so. all recording local here too. So yeah. if, if for some reason, and this has happened in the past, if something happens where, you know, maybe my kids were streaming and they're eating up all the bandwidth and things got messed up. I go in right away and I upload the recording from my local computer so we get oh, a nice smart. clean copy. That's smart. <laughs> hey, this is great content. We got a real renal dietitian sharing really helpful information. Don't want to have a risk of it getting all messed up over the <laughs> internet. <laughs> all right, let me see if there's some other questions in here. Do, 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 do. Someone says they got a they got a message that the stream has ended. Ah, it shows it's still streaming over here. Let me double check that real quick. Do you see any questions that you can answer on your end? Um, let me go back up and, and see. And I'm gonna check the stream while you're doing that. Let's see, let's see. Yep, we're still streaming on Facebook. Had a stream glitch with Facebook and they can do real time closed captioning for those that are in other countries. Though oh, that's cool. 
it's not always the best closed captioning when we're talking about drugs and and medical terms. When you're saying, you know, nephrologist, it, it's not a term it normally hears, so it could spell it all <laughs> different ways. It looks like YouTube is having some issues with some of their servers, so it may just be a mm. a YouTube issue. They have lots of servers all around the world. So it may just be some that are here in the U.S. that are having some glitches. Someone, I just saw a new question come through. I see one here about matcha green tea. So uh, for matcha green tea, that is different from brewed green tea. Matcha is basically like pulverized green tea leaves. So think of it as like super potent. It's like instant espresso, basically. It is great because it has a lot of antioxidants that are found in green tea, but a little can go a long way. So it's not something you need to have a ton of. There's great recipes and you can find a ton of them online all over the place that incorporate using matcha into baked goods, into breakfast, into oatmeal or smoothies. And that's a great way to include it. And again, a little bit goes a long way, but matcha tea can be something that can fit into a kidney friendly diet for sure. Uh, the other one that I saw was just really quick about keto and kidney oh. disease. And we had just talked about keto. Yeah. Anyone wanting to do a search, it can be hard to find stuff on YouTube because you're going to type in something and get all sorts of things. Hop over to dadvicetv.com. Go to the website. Mm -hmm. There's a search box there. You can type things in. It'll show you all the videos that contain that word. And the videos with you pick Jen Hernandez, there are all of her shows right here in order, oldest to newest. So it's a great way to go catch up on something from the past that you might have missed because YouTube, I mean, there's tons and tons of videos on there. Things can quickly get buried. All right, well, let's go ahead. We're going to we're gonna call it a night just, just so I can go out there and make sure that everything is okay. <laughs> Unless there's any last questions you want to answer. Um, I think we're good. I, I didn't see anything else. So I think videos, usually there's about a, a 15, 20 second delay between us talking and the audience hearing what we say for some of the questions. I think it's more than that several minutes behind. That could be the case. <laughs> but if you guys ever have questions too, you can ask them in the Facebook group. You can ask them on my Facebook mm -hmm. page. You can reach out. Uh, under each of my blogs, you can type in your questions to ask me there that's directly related to the content that we've covered tonight or just to kind of find out more information and to send me those questions because I will do my best to answer them. Now, what I can't say is if something's okay for you or for uh, individual recommendations, I'm always going to say you need to talk with your own healthcare team because I'm a dietitian. I'm not your dietitian unless we're working together and then I get to see all of your history. But I can still give as much information and answers and help as possible on the website, in our Facebook group, um, on the blog, anywhere like that. So feel free to reach out to me and I can help you out there. Awesome. Great. All right. Thank you, Jen, out there, you know, giving us your time, sharing your questions and being here, part of the Dadvice TV community. I will be back in two days this Thursday with Lana. We're doing another live show. Queen has some great information. So I look forward to seeing all of you in the next video. Bye everyone. <laughs>